Ladies and gentlemen, today we have with us a very famous and distinguished guest, Mr. General, General David Petreus, an extraordinary figure and a man of great merit for international security. Let me remind you that he was appointed by President George W. Bush to head multinational forces in Iraq in 2007 and 2008, and later he served as commander in chief of Central Command and as a commander of US and NATO forces in Afghanistan from 2010 until 2011. He later was director of the Central Intelligence Agency until 2012. A very warm welcome to you, General, and thank you for your taking the time to speak with me on the important topic of international security and threats. For obvious reason, I will focus on the war of the Russian Federation with Ukraine and the consequences of this war for regional and international security. Sir, let me ask the first question. On the 9th of March, 2022, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor for President Donald Trump, said, deterrence is working in the Ukraine crisis, just not for the right side. In this strategy, most catastrophic blunder, the United States and its allies failed to deter Russia from invading. Western deterrence fail, but now, Russian deterrence is enjoying, unfortunately, spectacular success. Can you comment, sir, on this statement, please? Uh, sure. First of all, it's great to be with you. Um, next, what I would offer is going to that, because what you have seen is the US, the UK, and other NATO countries, and indeed other Western countries, including Australia and others in the Asia Pacific region, helping Ukraine uh, withstand the offensive of Russia. Uh, and indeed, it has been this extraordinary amount of weapons, ammunition, uh, other supplies, other military systems in northern cities, uh, and indeed now conduct a counteroffensive to the east of Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, uh, where they appear to be about to drive Russian forces all the way back into Russia in that particular area of the battle, the logistical line of communication from the Russian logistical hub in Belgorod that supports the Russian operations in the eastern part of the country. Now, clearly, Russia has seized additional territory in the eastern, southeastern, and southern parts of Ukraine. But I think it's an open question right now whether Russia will be able to retain control of those areas, given the enormous amount of assistance that the arsenals, with an S on the end, of democracy are providing to Ukraine. It is true, that certainly, that Russia was not deterred uh, from attacking Ukraine. Uh, but again, uh, it is also true uh, that Russia has not deterred the US, UK, and other NATO countries from coming to the assistance of Ukraine in very very, very substantial ways. Uh, sir, uh, don't you think uh, Putin attacked Ukraine because he thought the West was weak? Uh, it is possible that that was part of his calculation. Uh, indeed, I think that the withdrawal of, from Afghanistan, uh, uh, which I suggested, we would look back on and uh, see as a mistake, and I believe we have, uh, but I think it's possible to assess that the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the inadequate consultation 
communication with our NATO partners and would be adversaries to say that the US is not a dependable partner and that it is a great power in decline. Uh, I think that our actions in the case of Ukraine uh, have proven that assessment to be wrong. Uh, there may have been other factors also that led uh, President Putin to attack when he did, perhaps some of the seasonal nature. He had his forces in the field for many months. Uh, he may have felt that now the ground might be hard. They might be able to attack across it uh, in that window of time uh, where the earth will be sufficiently frozen to support armored forces. Uh, it's also possible that he saw uh, correctly that Ukrainian forces were getting better and better and better. Uh, I visited uh, Ukraine not long after President Zelensky was elected. I met with all of his senior uh, defense and military officials. Uh, I visited the Donbass, the front lines. I went to Kharkiv. Uh, and I came from that visit uh, with a sense that the Ukrainian forces were not just very determined and very tough, very hard physically. And I'm an old infantryman. And I'd like to think I have some basis for assessing the toughness of great soldiers. Uh, but it was more than that. It was that they were much more professional, uh, that they had developed a non-commissioned officer corps, uh, that they had made a number of reforms that were enabling them to be a much more capable military force. Uh, clearly, Putin misjudged if he thought that he could easily defeat them. He also, of course, misjudged the capabilities of his own forces dramatically. Uh, and we can talk more about all of the failures of the main issue, uh, where he felt that this was the time to take this action, uh, that the West was in a bit of disarray in the wake of the Afghanistan withdrawal, uh, that the US and other countries were preoccupied with the rise of China and the shift of focus to the Indo-Pacific uh, and so forth. But clearly his calculations have proved to be catastrophically wrong. And he has now gotten Russia involved, what it appears to be increasingly a real quagmire. Sir, regarding to miscalculate, miscalculation, do you think the Russian intelligence prior to the intervention in Ukraine was uh, really very poor? Or the strategic plan uh, chaotic? Or uh, were the same other deeper reasons that made the operations no inept? Uh, it is all of the above, I think. Uh, I think that Russian intelligence was very poor. They completely underestimated the capabilities of the Ukrainian forces and very likely of the Western willingness to support Ukraine very, very aggressively and very substantially. Uh, it also appears that they dramatically overestimated the capabilities of their own forces. Uh, they overlooked the logistical structure deficiencies in the Russian forces. Once the Russians leave railways, as you know, uh, being very close to the Russians where you are geographically, uh, the Russian military depends very heavily on the rail system for its logistical support, for its movement, for its resupply, uh, and so forth. But then once it is away from that system but sir, can no longer depend on the amount of logistical structure when you compare it to ours. Ours is established for what might be termed uh, expeditionary logistics operations so that we could invade um, Iraq and travel 500 miles and still be able to keep our tanks refueled, uh, still feed and fuel our force. Um, the Russians have shown a complete inability to do that, a total uh, failure in their logistical structure. But there's more. Their campaign design was very flawed. They attacked everywhere. Uh, they did not have unity of command. There were three separate Russian commanders uh, in charge of the forces. Uh, it's only recently that they have established one commander, General Dvornikov, 
who of course is known as the butcher of Syria for the bombing of Aleppo mm -hmm. in 2016. Uh, the lack of a non-commissioned officer corps has been very and uh, the lack of training to any uh, to suppose training to state would acknowledge uh, or not the kind of professional standards uh, to which we hold our leaders and forces accountable. Uh, but again, it was capacity of their soldiers, the dependence on conscripts for 20 to 25 percent of their force, conscripts who are only in the force for a year uh, and then leave. And of course, they're supposed to have been released from service in April. They reportedly were not, uh, as Vladimir Putin waits for the next group of conscripts uh, to complete basic training and to jo join their units. Uh, but they've also shown an inability to replace the battlefield losses that they've sustained in, in personnel and also in weapon systems. So again, it's all of that uh, that has resulted in the really quite catastrophic underperformance and underachievement of the Russian forces, while noting still that although, yes, they did lose the battles of Kiev and Chernihiv and Sumy, and maybe now, perhaps the Battle of Kharkiv as well, nonetheless, they have established a ground bridge from the Donbass to Crimea, and they have seized more of the southern, southeastern, and eastern part of Ukraine than they controlled after 2014. Okay, sir. Uh, what uh, could you stress, what uh, is important to emphasize uh, in terms of defensive efforts of Ukrainians? Well, I think that they have been incredibly resourceful. Uh, they have shown real professional skill. Uh, you know, in a defense, you have to halt the enemy, um, and then you have to attack the enemy through the depth of his formation, if you can, once the enemy has been stopped. And they've shown a very effective use of uh, urban areas, built up areas, not the cities per se, but even just the suburbs, the villages outside the cities. Uh, they took advantage of the fact that Russian forces could not go off road. They had to stay on the road because the ground was very soggy. Options. Uh, vehicles literally have run out of out of fuel, uh, and then they have captured them. Uh, they have ha used very effective um, raiding strategies, uh, where forces on all-terrain vehicles uh, have gone up and down columns uh, to hit them from the flank. You'll remember that 40-mile-long, essentially, traffic jam, which was another sign of uh, inadequacy on the part of the Russians. Movement control is, a, is an art form. It's a very important task. And it's very clear that they were not exercising movement control. Beyond that, they clearly have never been able to achieve combined arms effects, which are what are necessary to reduce the defenses, uh, the obstacles uh, that stop you when you are attacking. They've not used infantry, armor, engineers, uh, emergency explosive disposal personnel, uh, artillery, mortars, close air support, none of that has been integrated in the way that I would like to think that we are able to do and other Western forces uh, trained to do as well. And I think we did demonstrate that, for example, during the invasion uh, of Iraq, uh, when I was privileged to be a, a two-star general and commander of the 101st Airborne Division. Um, I have noted that it in evaluating another country's invasion of a country, it helps if you have invaded a country yourself. Uh, okay, sir, uh, is it possible uh, to explain uh, us uh, what uh, criteria for success uh, could be for uh, Putin's and to stop grand operation? Well, I think that 
the deficiencies of the Russian forces are not ones that can be fixed in a short period of time. Uh, they are structural. They are uh, in terms of training. They're in terms of the force composition with a large number of conscripts. Uh, they are material inadequacies. We haven't yet discussed the fact that the communication systems of the Russians have proven very, very substandard. Uh, they are not on frequency, uh, uh, frequency hopping radios as such as we use that are also encrypted. They are single channel high frequency, which is very easy to identify with a police scanner, a radio scanner, and then you can either record it uh, or jam it. Uh, as Ukrainian civilians have done with considerable effect. We have heard uh, recorded radio calls of Russian leaders telling their troops essentially to commit war crimes, and in other cases of Russian troops uh, complaining about the shortcomings of their, their leadership, of their commissioned officers. Uh, and then, of course, the Ukrainians have jammed these radios very effectively, requiring battalion, brigade, and commanders and general officers to move to the front to find out what the nature of the delay is. And when they get out of their vehicles, very skilled Ukrainian snipers trained by U.S. Special Operations Forces uh, are, are killing them. Um, that's why there are 12 or more general officers uh, who have been killed in just the first two months of this particular operation. So again, all of these different deficiencies require uh, really institutional changes. These are not uh, shortcomings that can be fixed by some uh, reorganization in the short term. Uh, they require long-term long uh, professionalization. Again, the lack of a non-commissioned officer corps can't be fixed uh, in a couple of weeks, even if you recognize uh, the inadequacy of, of the lack of such a capability. Yes, sir. Uh, what scenario do you foresee for uh, further development of situation? And it is possible Putin attack more states, for instance, uh, Moldova, Kazakhstan, Georgia, etc. What is your assessment? I, I don't case? think that he has the capacity to attack additional states. Uh, I think Putin has more than enough problems with uh, what has transpired because of his unprovoked invasion of his neighbor, Ukraine. Uh, certainly, Russia would like to get to Moldova and to link up with the Russian forces in Transnistria. Um, however, they can't even get all the way to Odessa. They can't even get halfway to Odessa. They were stopped at Mykolaiv, uh, about halfway from Crimea to Odessa. And they've actually been pushed back from there now. Uh, they were never able to seize the two key bridges that run across the river uh, through Mykolaiv. Uh, those bridges, by the way, would have been blown up by the Ukrainians if they'd had to, but they did not even have to do that. Uh, so again, it's, it, it's beyond Russia's capability to open another front of military operations uh, where they would show their deficiencies even more, I suspect. So your conclusion is uh, that it's not possible to capture all uh, Ukrainian territory in a short uh, time. But uh, hypothetically, if Putin would occupy all Ukrainian and Russian troops would stop on the Book River, uh, how do you assess the threat uh, to NATO, Eastern Flank? I, I don't think that's a hypothetical even worth considering. It's just completely unrealistic. Okay, I understand. Uh, again, we have seen that he could not even seize his most uh, significant objective. The primary objective in the beginning was to seize the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv, topple the government, and replace mm -hmm. President Zelensky with a pro-Russian figure after which presumably Russian forces would parade triumphantly through Kyiv and then return to Moscow uh, for a triumphant parade there uh, as well. That obviously proved completely beyond their capacity. They could not even get to the outskirts of the real city. Uh, instead, they withdrew their forces from there and also from Sumy and Chernihiv, the two other northern cities that they were unable to take. 
and they put those forces into eastern Ukraine and southeastern Ukraine, they have achieved some modest gains there, but it enormous to hold on to the territory that they have seized as the additional support from the US and other NATO nations uh, is employed by Ukraine in the front lines. Again, the, the amount of assistance we have provided is staggering. Uh, it's $3.8 billion worth of weapon systems, ammunition, and other supplies just from the US, just since the invasion began. Uh, that is a huge amount of support. And of course, the UK, uh, Poland, uh, other Eastern and Western European countries and Central European countries have provided uh, substantial assistance as well. Germany, for the first time, provided lethal assistance uh, to another country. Um, again, this is massive, uh, and Russia is fighting not just Ukraine, a country that is fully in Ukraine, is also supported by the arsenals of democracy from around the world. And I think that's a formula uh, for ultimately beyond a quagmire uh, for Russia, it's a formula for disaster. Right. Sir, Poland um, is trying for a very long time establish NATO military permanent basis uh, on the soil. Uh, do you think is it possible uh, to do it uh, very soon or not? Well, I think whether they are permanent or not, that's really just a definition is almost immaterial because they will be there all the time. Uh, it's really about whether or not the forces are there for six or 12 months uh, or for 36 months. Um, and again, I think that almost doesn't matter. Uh, it's the same with the doubling of the forces in the Baltic states. Um, how that is achieved over time, how that's sustained over time, I think is largely immaterial. The fact is that it will be sustained uh, and the question is, what's the most efficient way to do that uh, for our forces? Uh, and I think, again, over time, you will see a greater permanent presence, uh, noting that obviously this is also a policy decision, and I don't want to get ahead of my own government and ahead of the Polish government as well. Okay. Sir, I have the last question. Maybe the question is provocative. Uh, but um, some of experts uh, claim that the war in Ukraine is a proxy war between the United States and the uh, Russian Federation. Could you comment on it? Well, what I really think this is, is a war between democracy and autocracy, or democracy and kleptocracy, which is a more accurate description of the system uh, in Russia. And I think that is an accurate description uh, of the situation. Uh, and it is because of this and because of the enormous challenge Russia has made to the rules-based international order. This is the first time a country in Europe has been invaded since World War II. Uh, this cannot be allowed. Uh, it has to be resisted. It has created enormous unity. I was at the Munich Security Conference, which ended, of course, a day before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. I saw more unity at that Munich Security Conference than I have seen since I was a, a major and a speechwriter for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe back in the days of the Cold War. Uh, and the transformation since that time, with the wall coming down, with the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, uh, dissolving uh, the transformation of Central and Eastern Europe. This has been breathtaking. Uh, and I think this was a time where those, particularly in the Central and Eastern European part, um, recognized the importance of being NATO members and of standing up for democracy 
and resisting autocracy, having thrown off autocracy, of course. I should just note, by the way, first of all, I was privileged, I think uniquely privileged uh, as an American commander to have Polish forces under my command in two wars, in Iraq and also in Afghanistan, uh, after having worked with them uh, in the stabilization force in Bosnia. And they were magnificent in every one of those missions. Uh, and all Polish citizens should be very proud of what their men and women in uniform did in those various missions and wars. Beyond that, I was actually in uh, Poland, in Warsaw, uh, with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I was a colonel at the time. I was his chef de cabinet, his executive officer, as we term it, uh, when NATO actually formally joined, uh, when uh, actually Poland formally joined NATO. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a very special day. Uh, there was an observance of it uh, at I, what I believe is your tomb of the unknown soldier, a, 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 a location uh, similar to that in the United States. Um, it was really a very emotional moment uh, and one that I have cherished ever since. That was in the late <clears throat> 1990s, obviously. Um, and again, ever since then, Poland has been a very staunch member uh, of NATO and a very staunch ally uh, of the United States and the other 29 NATO members. Um, Poles should be very proud of what they have done uh, and a deed of what they have done in this case as well, where Poland obviously is the, in many respects, the uh, entry point into Ukraine for this massive quantity of arms, ammunition, and other military supplies and other assistance. Uh, and also very proud of the way that they have helped their Ukrainian neighbors when some 8 million more or more uh, have left that country because of the war. Uh, and they have taken them in, uh, embraced them, as have, of course, other uh, Eastern, Central, and Western European countries. Um, and so in, in closing, if if I could just say uh, thank you uh, on behalf of, again, the soldiers that I was privileged to lead, contributed uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and also uh, in, in Bosnia and other uh, NATO missions uh, in the Balkans. Um, and again, how grateful I think all of the democracies of the world are uh, to see what Poland is doing uh, to help its democratic neighbor, Ukraine. Sir, thank you for uh, warm uh, words. <laughs> uh, I would like to kindly thank you for uh, your time and very accurate uh, strategic assessment. I very much appreciate that you were willing to share your vast knowledge of international security with the conference participants. I wish you all the best, and I hope to see you in Poland very soon. You will see.